coffee, stretch. It's a re really uh, relaxed event. We are here to learn from each other. So uh, just a few slides and a video to introduce you to the wonderful work of uh, Catalyst. I think that there are many friends joining. Oh, Dan is here. Wonderful to have you here. We're just giving a, a, some time for people to uh, join. In a minute, Mariana, who is part of the wonderful team, who is always supporting us at Catalyst, is going to share a video to introduce you to Catalyst. Catalyst 2030 started life as a WhatsApp group among social entrepreneurs, connecting to envision real transformational change. Launched at the World Economic Forum in January 2020, it's grown into a global movement accelerating change to ensure the SDGs are reached by 2030. Fueled by passion, our 550 members working in 175 countries have collectively put in an amazing 50,000 volunteer hours, touching the lives of 2 billion people. And we're driven by values, to which we hold ourselves accountable. 2020 was a busy year, co-creating three reports with partners and producing one of our own. Inviting high-level guests to participate in the Catalyzing Change campaign, hosting fireside chats and expert hours, which will be continuing in 2021. To celebrate our achievements, together we placed our supporters in the limelight with the first Catalyst 2030 Awards for Systemic Change. With the blessing of the Dalai Lama, we celebrated finalists and winners in the following categories. Special recognition for our early supporters, individual philanthropists, donor organizations, philanthropic intermediaries, corporate organizations, bi- and multilateral organizations, and four regional winners in the category of national governments. And now on to Catalyzing Change Week 2021. During this social entrepreneur-led event, we bring together diverse stakeholders in over 100 sessions to showcase their systems change efforts and the best practices that can accelerate our work in pursuit of the SDGs. Wonderful, thanks so much, Mariana. Again, once more time, I would like to acknowledge the work of uh, Catalyst 2030 and like, it's really helping us come together and creating solutions and create momentum to advance SDG. So if you're working in the field, please join. I would like to wel on welcome all of you and thank you for being here. You could have been anywhere else, but you're with us. So it's very much appreciated. I'm super excited about the event of today. I would like to, uh, before we get started, remind all of you that you will be recorded. The event is recorded for uh, be able to use it in the future. It's completely open source, so you can feel free also to use it anywhere else that you want. So uh, that would be lovely. Uh, if you also keep your camera on, so we all see that we are meeting with people and of the community. So as you've seen in the video, Catalyst 2030 and therefore the Catalyst and Change Week is about the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals. So you may be wondering why are we speaking about tourism and in the context of something about the Sustainable Development Goals. So I thought that before we move to our event, I'm going to be very brief, um, we're going to discuss, I was going to set a bit the stage about tourism and why it matters. So something that uh, you must know is that tourism is a gigantic sector. Prior to COVID, it was representing 8 trillion US dollars per year. In, in 2019, 8 trillion uh, US dollars was 10% of the global gross GDP. It had been growing faster than the global GDP for years in a row. It looked like an industry that would never stop. It was providing 330 million jobs, many of which to people who are often at the march. Like you had like a lot of women who are getting jobs uh, from the industry. Many people who have no skills, people who are um, moving from one country to another, people with disabilities. So it's an industry that is very important and that reaches where other industry does not reach. For example, in the small islands around the world. It's an important industry that matters. 
and through COVID is being put to a halt with other people threatened to be losing their livelihood and threat posed to conservation funding and so on. So tourism is very important. It's deep into our communities. It touches to every single aspect of it, of all the places where we live and travel. Think about the economy, but also the identity, the community, the heritage, both natural and uh, cultural. It's completely cross cutting like we would say when we speak about the SDGs. So the objective of today is to discuss two things. To discuss, one, why, uh, once, why we must transform tourism because although it does bring a lot uh, of jobs, we don't want it to remain uh, the way it was um, before this crisis. And so Anna Pollock, who I'm super excited, is going to uh, talk about that later. An amazing thought leader is going to talk more about this topic. And we are also joined by Ryan Levis, who is going to share with us an amazing example of how tourism can help you if you're a social entrepreneur working on the ground, to advance your mission, how it can be a tool to support the work that you're going at the community level for your communities. So with no further ado, I'm, I'm going to move to the session. Just um, letting you know one more thing is that it's meant to be very interactive. So you're going to have time for questions after each intervention. We'll work in two segments, starting first with the case of Ryan. So Ryan Lewis that you can see here on the screen with a beautiful smile is a community business, uh, is part of Blue Venture, which is a community business enterprise, which is taking care of um, marine conservation. He's a mar marketing and marine tourism specialist who has been working within the ecotourism and wildlife conservation sector for the past five years as a technical advisor of ecotourism business development and marketing at Blue Ventures. Ryan focuses on building sustainable marine ecosystem business models that directly support both local livelihoods and environmental needs. Showcasing that inclusive and community-centered initiatives can be the most effective approach in meeting the needs of local people and protecting the environment that they depend upon. This portfolio includes Blue Ventures, award-winning marine conservation expedition in Madagascar, Belize, and Timor Leste, a growing network of community homestay enterprise in the Indo-Pacific, and new community-based tourism initiatives in Thailand and Indonesia. So, the conversation of, uh, with Diana is going to be having for objective to illustrate how tourism can help support community-based projects and showcase what a Blue Venture has been up to. So uh, Ryan, uh, thank, thanks again for uh, joining us today. Could you please maybe uh, start by telling us what, a bit more about what Blue Venture is and what the problem it addresses and how and what is unique uh, about the project? Yeah, of course. Um, but firstly, thank you very much for, for having me here today. Um, yeah, I realize my, my experience is probably quite small compared to a lot of other people in this room, but hopefully, um, yeah, some of Blue Ventures work um, and the work that we're progressing at the moment will be quite interesting to, to the audience. Um, so yeah, just to give you a very brief kind of introduction to, to Blue Ventures and what we are. So we're a nonprofit organization. Torum is one part of what we do, um, but it's uh, yeah, it's a much lar larger program than that. So I'll just kind of say that the very top line of our work is working together with tropical coastal communities um, to rebuild the fisheries that they depend upon. So we work with small scale fishing communities um, across a host of different countries, but our work started in Madagascar and then expanded uh, across the Western Indian Ocean into East Africa Indonesia, Timor-Leste and Belize, uh, where we face yeah, similar challenges in the communities there where we, um, I mean, it's no secret really that our oceans are facing these unprecedented threats from combined impacts of climate change, unsustainable fishing, pollution, uh, over tourism, and then more recently, a global health pandemic. Um, and this combination has led to, to fish stocks collapsing worldwide really uh, and this threatens the security and livelihoods of hundreds of million people uh, depending on fishing for their survival. Um, so these are the people that we work with um, and for uh, and we believe that marine conservation um, has often broken down in the past and, and still does to a certain degree when they fail to resonate with the needs of those coastal communities. Um, and we believe that such failure is avoidable uh, since coastal populations have the greatest long-term interest in marine conservation success. 
Uh, so at Blue Ventures, we were committed to tackling this conundrum by developing conservation models that work for people, uh, showing that effective marine conservation is, is in everyone's interest. Um, so key to this is an inclusive, multifaceted uh, approach centered around six core programs. Um, so the largest one that we do is rebuilding fisheries. So supporting coastal communities to rebuild their fisheries by establishing temporary fishing closures, um, permanent marine reserves, uh, while adding value to seafood supply chains. Um, and key to, to this model is making marine management make economic sense to communities who depend upon them. Uh, and therefore we have a load of supporting programs that, that help make that happen. Uh, alternative livelihoods um, is one of the biggest in, and most important parts of this program. Um, so we have different forms of that. We have aquaculture, um, that reduces the pressure on fisheries, build, builds new capacities in the community, aids financial independence, um, and has positive impacts on marine environments when managed sustainably. Uh, we work in blue forests, so that's mainly mangrove and seagrass conservation, pioneering uh, new incentives for, for local marine conservation, including through blue carbon finance and international voluntary carbon markets. Uh, we work in community health uh, and education, um, and then lastly, community-based tourism or, or ecotourism, um, which really kind of kick-started our organization in 2003, so it's almost 18 years ago now. Um, and this was built in a, in a very simple and effective way. So ecotourists uh, generate secure and sustainable funding that allow for long-term community and conservation development. Uh, so instead of generating financial gains for shareholders, all profits are channeled to support community-led grassroots conservation efforts um, that support people uh, and nature alike. Wonderful. So a fantastic example of uh, community-based work and centered work. So uh, you quickly touched on it, but why did your project, which is about marine conservation, start venturing uh, into tourism? Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, so, I mean, it really started by us listening to the communities that we were working with um, and listening to their needs and developing models that, that could help address those needs. Um, and tourism provided a real catalyst for our work in that sense. It helped us to establish, uh, establish and achieve several goals at the same time. So it created another alternative livelihood to fishing, which takes the pressure off those fisheries. Um, and it makes periodic reef closures more acceptable and possible to the people that you are asking to fish less um, or certainly fish less in certain areas um, of their ecosystems. Um, at the same time, we used voluntourism activities um, to collect reef data. Um, so this included uh, teaching ecotourists how to dive and how to collect ecological underwater data. Um, and then we monitored the biomass of the, the health of the fisheries and the coral reefs, um, both in the protected areas and in the control sites so that we could really see the impact of what our local marine management efforts were having. And yeah, that was able to demonstrate to the communities that the work that was happening was worthwhile and was having a positive impact. Um, and in return, that makes the, the tourists feel like they are doing something in a more meaningful and they are contributing to something um, yeah, very worthwhile. Um, but also, I mean, it creates extra capacity. Again, it provides new skills and experiences with the community, um, which is something that they desperately needed because there was a dependency on fisheries. Um, and it was very effective in showcasing that healthy environments and healthy ecosystems showcases further value um, in keeping them that way and that they can create money um, from marine management and from protecting um, their, their natural resources and environment. Um, and I'd say the last point I'd probably make there is that it gives uh, a really great economic boost into the wider community as well. So a whole host of supporting products and services can be built off the back of this type of program. So it started with an expedition that was very much led around data collection. Um, but through that, we were able to develop things like homestays and cooking groups um, and day trips um, such as birding or um, pescatourism trips. Um, so there's a whole host of kind of supporting activities that brought money back into the community that wouldn't have necessarily seen tourists without this program being in place. Um, so yeah, it addressed a, a multitude of needs really. And could you tell a bit more about that please, about what tourism has enabled in your venture and how it has supported your objectives? Yeah, so I think that the, the 
the really key thing here for kind of our long term and our sustainability of working with these communities um, and thinking long term, because a lot of marine conservation can often be short term because it's dependent on funding cycles. Um, but it, what it did, it, it was it gave us permanency in the area. So it allowed us to create stronger relationships with the community, allowed us to build trust in what we were trying to achieve, um, it allowed us to understand the challenges in greater detail. Uh, and ultimately to be able to work more collaboratively. So we, we don't work in a, in a top-down way at all. Everything is built from the ground up with the communities um, hand in hand, and we, we very much support, um, yeah, their work. Um, and we, we enable them and empower them to, to be able to progress. Uh, and then over time, we actually, we're taking more of a back step. So when we first started, obviously that involved a lot of international um expertise coming in and building that capacity but today we have over 150 members of staff in madagascar and that's not all tourism based that's across all of our programs um but i believe it's about 85 percent now is local staff so staff that are from madagascar um or from the actual region um that we're working in in the southwest of, of andabadoc so um, yeah, for us, that's the kind of vindication that the model is working and that the community have really taken on board all of these things. Um, and yeah, unfortunately, up until COVID, it was the tourism side of our work was looking incredibly strong and was going from strength to strength. And we were seeing that there was a lot more people interested in responsible and sustainable tourism where you can do things in a different way. Um, so, yeah, it's a, a shame that we've had this break in play for the last 12 months. but. I think what it does is gives us all a chance to rethink exactly what we want tourism to be and to find good examples and to build on them uh, and to keep improving so that we can yeah, create a more sustainable sector. I, I can hear uh, the crowd of social entrepreneurs and tourism um, practitioner clap <laughs> and to your words. I mean, it's wonderful. Um, you were starting to speak about the challenges that you're facing. Could you say a bit more about that? Some challenges you face, victories you won, and maybe share with us some lessons learned? Yeah, of course. I mean, the biggest challenge is, is certainly COVID. Um, so there, there has been challenges along the way. And I think for us, before COVID, it was mainly based around the fact that we're working in very very remote areas where capacity is, is is often quite small so you really have to to build that from the ground up and that can take time and resource um, um, often which yeah you don't necessarily have with with funding cycles and grants so yeah we were enabled to to find success by having permanency in those areas and navigating those barriers but by far COVID has been the biggest challenge uh, particularly from a financial sense so um, we are a non-profit, we are a charitable organization, but our expeditions, our tourism side of the business was a business enterprise, so it did need to break even, and then the profits were put back into the charity. Um, and yeah, I mean, financially, it's, it's, it's been really hard um, since we had to refund 12 months worth of bookings, um, and the structure that we had uh, that we had created, um, we did have to reduce. We absorbed as much of that staff as possible to keep them involved in other projects. Um, but ultimately, it did involve some people losing their jobs, and that is the, the saddest thing for me. Um, but we're working incredibly hard on finding new ways to kind of um, to improve our models um, and to keep going and for when tourism returns to do things in an even more sustainable and responsible manner. Um, so that's really exciting. But I'd say the biggest success story we've had out of that um, is that the work that we had done with this tourism product in Madagascar in collecting this data for 18 years uh, and how that helped inform decision making in these locally led marine conservation groups um, they see the impact of that and they see the positives in that and they have continued to learn and to collect that data. So at the moment we have community monitoring groups based out of the community that are still diving and still monitoring these sites and still collecting that data and still showcasing that back to their communities to continue that learning process and continue those marine management um, efforts that have been so important. And that's amongst the fact that at the moment there's more pressure on fisheries and there's more pressure on our environment than there has ever been before because a lot of these alternative livelihoods have been affected which means that natural resources ultimately um, take the brunt um, of that impact and it puts pressure back on those those livelihoods um, 
so yeah, the fact that they're continuing those methods, um, even with all of these challenges has been really encouraging. Um, and yeah, I'm, from a learning perspective, I'd say the biggest take that I've experienced is how important learning exchanges are. Um, so we work with several different communities and different places and different cultures, and we adapt our models to them. Um, but providing learning exchanges and having communities that face similar challenges, learning from each other, whether they're visiting each other and learning from each business enterprise or each business model has been a really empowering exercise that has yeah, developed um, community enterprises beyond um, beyond what I thought was possible in quite short time scales. So yeah, learning exchanges um, has been a really big success for us as well. And one that I would certainly recommend. I mean, the work that you're doing is absolutely amazing. You can be proud of all of this carrying out even in this difficult time. Um, like, so you mentioned it quickly, uh, Blue Venture Tourism has been like many of other uh, initiatives in tourism victim of COVID. But uh, could you please share with us what's in your mind and what are the different options that you're now considering? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think for us at the moment, we, we've got all of our options on the table. So whether that's restarting our expeditions as they were or changing um, certain elements to make it more focused and to improve our impact. Um, but I think the biggest one for us at the moment is to try and find ways um, of increasing our portfolio of accessible community-based tourism initiatives because with our expeditions program it involved diving a lot of equipment a lot of expertise that's not always possible um, it has large costs it's very hard in remote areas to achieve that so we're trying to find new ways of developing community-led community -led tourism community-based tourism um, that can be more easily implemented and still have the same benefits and impacts within the community and for eco-tourists. Um, but yeah, it's maybe more easy to set up and more easy to get off the ground, but still with a really clear, sustainable development pathway to, to be able to grow it into something much bigger. So at the moment, we're, we're thinking about models such as homestays um, that can be a really great entry point to tourism, especially in communities that don't have a tourism infrastructure. Homestays can be a brilliant way to, to get off the ground and to encourage that entrepreneurial spirit and to open their eyes to how ecotourism can work uh, and then build supporting products and services around that. So once they have this, this kind of more simple and effective model um, running, then they can start to build other things off of that model, such as, um, yeah, such as uh, food and drink uh, experiences um, or day trips or citizen science activities um so there really is a, an array of different options that they can go to from there and a bit it really does depend on the area and the community and what their kind of uh their needs are um so homestays could be one really great option but in another area community tours um have been a really good entry point for us um different types of citizen science activities whether that's uh, monitoring seagrass beds um or yeah, monitoring uh, fish biomass. There's lots of different options that we're currently exploring as a way of kind of having these quick and mobilizing tourism enterprises that can be built into something much bigger. Um, but yeah, at the moment we're, we're still kind of analyzing all of those things um, and we hope to be able to produce some exciting uh, business ventures in, in the next six to 12 months once things start to, to get moving again. Wonderful. And I, I remember that you were pay, uh, t talking to me about paying uh, attention about uh, like ensuring that you enabling more tourism uh, that is domestic, both because that's um, making it uh, better uh, mm -hmm. for the communities, more appreciated by the communities, but also it might be more sustainable. And, all, and so uh, there's some dynamics that remove the colonialist feel that might be coming from uh, the um, the regular kind of tourism that which is only international and so maybe we can touch a bit about that in the question that we're going to start now because I saw people commenting uh, about this I would just like to uh, before we open to the floor to invite Anna uh, to join us and maybe react uh, to, to what Ryan has said share maybe some views on uh, what they've been doing and their plans. Well, I'll be brief, but I'm incredibly impressed, Ryan. Um, I think this is um, 
speaks more about what regeneration regenerative tourism is than than anything else i think a really great working example um you know an organization that clearly has has all of the right regenerative principles at work the the values um i'm very excited that you can see an opportunity um to expand your portfolio i'd love to explore that with you um because i think we need i'm a great believer that every place is unique so you don't just you don't do a starbucks on this you know <laughs> but what we do need is a way of amplifying and um sharing what works the the mix and then and then in full partnership with locals uh local people to make sure that that reflects their that they are engaged in in making it work for them so uh, yeah, uh, congratulations. We need more examples like that. I think um, I'll let let the floor go to the to, to all of the other people in the room, many more experienced, practically than I am. So they'll have more difficult questions to make. Yeah, thank you for that, Anna. I think that's really key as well is that we try and create these models that are scalable, so that we can really improve our impact, um, but that are adaptable, so that they do meet the very specific needs of the communities that you're working with. So. Yeah. Yeah, that's absolutely getting uh, that balance between generics, what works generically, but most importantly, um, how we shape that locally. Mm. Absolutely. So Ryan uh, will have to leave us in four minutes because the team is growing and so he has some interviews coming. So we'd like to invite you to unmute yourself. You have a question and please keep your question as short as possible. So we uh, might have uh, at least two um, people able to ask Ryan uh, what they are interested in knowing. So please unmute yourself and feel free to ask a question. Otherwise, we just pick one from the chat. I should, I should mention as well that um, as I do have to leave quite promptly, I'm, I'm sorry about that. Um, if anybody does have any other questions for me that I don't get around to answering, um, please do email me afterwards um, and I'll do my best to, to get back to you later on today. Uh, Ravi, go ahead. You're on mute. Sorry, can you hear me? Ryan, uh, thanks for sharing your perspectives. I would really like to know how you position your product to potential customers and how you kind of attract demand, uh, both B2C as well as B2B. If you can talk about that, that'd be awesome. Thank you. Excellent. Yeah, it's a really great question. Um, so for, for years, um, when we were in a startup mode, um, it, it was very much word of mouth and we didn't have to do too much because people were hearing about our work. Uh, especially if they had an interest in Madagascar and yeah we would have more interest than we did spaces um, on our expeditions um, and over time we've, we've been able to build up almost kind of an ambassador program of people that have been interested in our work more widely um, and yeah are therefore really interested when we ever have um, expeditions or tourism experiences available um, but more recently in the last couple of years we have tried to do more um, in the digital marketing scene um, and that's really been playing towards the more responsible ecotourism market. So basically marketing a more meaningful uh, ecotourism experience where you can contribute to marine conservation. So that's kind of been our niche is, is people that are ocean enthusiasts um, and driven by marine conservation and community development work. Um, so it's quite a small market, um, but it's one that we've been very effective in, in reaching through um, traditional channels, uh, we do a lot of communications work organically as well, talking about our work. Um, but, you know, we've also used um, paid channels as well, um, paid, uh, paid ads on uh, Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. There's been probably the biggest success that we've had in creating new leads um, and converting those from there. Um, and, yeah, just being able to target people. Um, so um so effectively on those channels was was a real big plus for us but i would still say to this day that organic traffic just through the communications of our work um has the best conversion rates and allows us to keep this kind of constant stream of people coming our way um which has has really helped but for sure there's probably more that we can do in the future and we will look to to develop those plans as we look to to build new tourism uh models moving forwards as well Thank Ryan. You um, Ryan, do you have to leave on the top? Do we have like the time for one more question? So it's 11 or, or so, like you must leave we us. We could do one more. We okay. could do one more. Karis, your floor is yours. 
You're on mute. Uh, yes, excuse me. Um, so I don't know if you've answered my question in the chat. Uh, you did, because I had to, to hop out uh, for a minute. Uh, what part of the tourists uh, in, in your project come from the same country or from abroad? Yeah, that's, uh, that's another good question. Um, so in the, in the past, before COVID, these were mainly international tourists. So our operations, our tourism operations were very much centered in Madagascar, Belize and Timor-Leste. Um, and I would say over 85% of those were international tourists, um, mainly coming from the Western world and the Northern Hemisphere. Um, so that's something when I say we want to make more accessible tourism operations. So I'm thinking both from a community perspective and being able to actually uh, build these operations, um, but also from a tourist perspective, we want to open ourselves up to more local markets, to more domestic markets. Uh, and that's something that our old model wasn't particularly good at. Um, it was very reliant on international tourists. Um, so yeah, I think that's something that we do need to change. And that's a way that the market is heading anyway, in that people are looking for more local and domestic experiences. I do believe there will always be a market for international tourism. Like that's never going to, um, that's never going to die down completely. Um, but I think it's important that we do focus on having a variety of different options, um, and making the whole industry more accessible. Um, and more compatible with, um, yeah, local nations, particularly uh, in more low-income countries. Thank you very much, Ryan. Um, well, I don't want to uh, make you come late to your uh, meeting, so I just want to thank you again. Um, how can people stay in touch with you? Um, so email is, is definitely the, the best way to, to do that. Um, so my, my email is ryan at blueventures.org. Um, we also have a website, blueventures.org, um, which has a list of all of our different staff and employees on there. So um, <clears throat> there is more information on there as well. Um, so yeah, please do get in touch if you have any other questions or if you'd like to have a conversation about a particular part of our work or a topic. Um, and yeah, I look forward to being part of this movement um, at Catalyst um, and hopefully yeah we can help change the sector together um, but thank you for, for listening to me today. Thank you so much for being with us Ryan and uh, we'll see you soon. Thank you very much. Bye, Bye guys. Well that was exciting wasn't it? So uh, everybody thanks for uh, still being with us. Uh, so now it's my honor my pleasure i'm delighted to like spend some time in that second segment speaking with anna so for those of you who don't know uh, enough about anna anna pollock is the founder of conscious travel uh, she has 48 years yes 40 of experience in tourism as an independent consultant strategist internal speaker and change agent and she's she's now acclaimed as a thought leader if not the best first leader, a part leader in the emerging field of regenerative tourism. Anna has worked with a host of uh, past clients going from the Canadian Tourism Commission, PATA, to Innovation Norway, Visit Flanders, and many, many uh, other clients. She's been the recipient of the uh, Visionary of the Year Award from the Canadian Tourism Industry. She has undertaken seminal work in many aspects of tourism, notably in education, sustainability, and technology. During the 90s, Anna established herself as a thought leader on the strategic implication of the internet. She created the first internet-based tourism strategy for Scotland, and she co-developed one of the first multi-purpose destination management system. She's also prepared one of the first reports of the impact of climate change for the Canadian tourism industry in 2007. Her strength in her ability to see the world is uh, her ability to see the world big picture to ask difficult questions and to help others make sense of their rapidly and dramatically changing world. Uh, since 2010, Anna's focus on investing in emergent alternative models for tourism sector that would enable the shift from extraction to regeneration. So I know it speaks to a lot of people uh, in the audience today and that generates a higher yields with less impact. After several years of research, she published her thinking in a comprehensive report, Social Enterprise and Tourism, the concert, uh, the concert Travel Approach. 
data is now used as text in many universities around the world. And I know that some people in the audience are using it. I know that there are people who was involved with, uh, with Anna in this undertaking with Roberto Diane, who are uh, in the audience. Um, Anna is being retained by Visit Flanders. She's working with the New Zealand destination organization as the only uh, member who is not from the, uh, New Zealand. She's also working with Northern Ireland. Mm -hmm. So I guess that you get a sense of the fact that Anna has been at it for many, many years. She's seen the sector evolve and she has a host of wisdom uh, to share with us. So thank you very much for being with us uh, today, Anna. So I would like to maybe ask you, and to start maybe with introducing a bit what you're doing with conscious travel, the work that you do, and uh, maybe speak about um, what regenerative tourism is all about and why it's so discussed now, and uh, why you think is particularly relevant to communities that like that of uh, Ryan's and the one we're working on, and also to nature. Yeah. Well, Valeria, thank you so much for for inviting me um, and. Yeah, for introducing me to Catalyst, which um, is a very inspiring organization. I'm, I'm going to join if you'll have me. Um, you've certainly been very productive, um, which is very and very impressive. And also for this meeting today and a chance to listen to people like Ryan. I mean, I, I genuinely, you know, I, my role has been, uh, you know, thought leader, change agent, call it what you will. I'm, I'm, I, I've been prepared to be quite outspoken for quite a long time. Um, and now I see a, a, there's such an, uh, it's kind of like washing mushrooms in the autumn, you know, all of these networks are now starting to pop out of the, the, it, their invisibility. And, um, you know, that's exactly what we need. We need uh, examples. Um, I see Vicky in the audience. I mean, Vicky's another great champion uh, who's bringing, been bringing um, examples of people doing this for, for some time. Um, and I'm delighted also to see colleague uh, Diane Dredge here, um, because Diane is, uh, again, very experienced in this field and uh, able to bring a level of what I would call intellectual rigor uh, combined with good practice. So we need all kinds of skills and talents uh, right now. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I feel a bit apologetic about the long intro. <laughs> we were discussing that. Um, I said the challenge when you've been around as long as I have, you know, it's, it's hard to keep that short. Um, and it will be 50 years in 2023 since I started out in Western Canada. Um, and so I think we should have a party and hopefully in Venice somewhere. Um, so uh, yeah, I'm gonna just uh, really talk about where, where I'm at now. Um, uh, I formed Conscious Travel really just to open up this debate um, as to the need for change. Um, my focus is not so much on the traveler. Um, there are great organizations like right now with the Transformational Travel Council, uh, regenerativetravel.com, where the focus is a little bit more on how do we get travelers to be more responsible, more mindful, more aware. Um, but I very much feel that that awareness, that generation of the need for change and how to change has to happen with the host and it has to happen in, in community. So that's the orientation for me. Um, and, you know, this whole it, regeneration now is becoming a buzzword and that does concern me. Um, it's the new trendy thing and our industry just loves trends. I mean, that's why people go to conferences because we sell a perishable product. We want to find out what is the next new shiny object that we should be pursuing. And at the moment, that appears to be regeneration. And I'm concerned because it's not a trend. I mean, this is a fundamental shift or requires a fundamental shift in how we see ourselves as human beings on the planet with each other. Um, how or, That's going to affect every aspect of our lives because the entire Western system, which is now dominated thinking globally, um, is based on a set of assumptions and values about how the world works, which, uh, yeah, let's face it, it, it did a lot of good for us. It, it created a huge amount of wealth, um, but it also has created a lot of destruction as well. And ultimately, uh, we're at that point now where it's past its real sell, <laughs> you, you know, it's a uh, sell by date, it's, it's beginning to produce more hazards than, than good. Um, regeneration has not, uh, it, to me, there's a reason why the word, the, the letters R-E are in front of regeneration. 
because it, it is not uh, new. It is actually a remembering, and the English language is fantastic in this regard, to remember means to piece together something. So what we did in the Western world was we started to break things up into pieces. We, we began to believe that we were separate from each other, separate from nature. And the, the way we can understand it was to literally define everything. You know, So that's what we do, particularly when we go to school or in academia, the first thing you have to do is define it. So people tell me define regeneration as if it were a thing. And that's the other thing about regeneration. It's not a thing. It's a way of thinking. Um, it's not about less either, because a lot of people think, oh yeah, sustainability, that's, you know, you know, means less, less profit, less this, less that. But actually I think it's about generating more, more of the things that count um, and what counts, what matters. That's health, that's vitality, that's resilience. That's our capacity to care for one another, that's community. And, it's not about growth in size. That's the one thing we're questioning. It's about uh, growth in, uh, in quality and in, in complexity and order and beauty. And again, what it really is all about is, is starting to understand how to act as uh, nature would act. It was Gregory Bateson, the great ecologist, who said, you know, all of the problems that we're having on this planet are due to the fact that we do not think and act as nature does. So what's changed? I mean, this is knowledge that indigenous people have carried with them and they are the most vital uh, element of our societies right now because they've kept that knowledge. But what's fantastic is that Western science that had this particularly rigid way of approaching things has come full circle mm -hmm. <laughs> back to understanding some of these fundamental um, principles. Um, so uh, in that sense, it's a coming home, I think it is. Um, I call it a maturation. We're beginning to grow up uh, as humanity. Um, so we definitely can need sustainable practices. There's no doubt about that. To shrink our footprint, use fewer resources, uh, generate less waste, do less harm. But there are two problems. We're not keeping pace with our own growth. We certainly weren't until COVID came along. Um, and there weren't enough people asking the most fundamental question, which is what are we trying to sustain? So if we're trying to sustain a system that is now recognized for being flawed, um, if it's business as usual, then we're not going to get the thriving economy we want. So again, what is regeneration? It's about systems change. It's about getting to the root cause of the challenges that we have. Um, and, you know, in that if it's not radical if it's not transformative then it's not regeneration so um yeah i don't know i'll stop there if you like i'm trying to keep an eye on time because you know my tendency to talk too much um i have notes all timed out but i always deviate so um yeah keep asking me questions and i'll make sure i stay in track <laughs> and i don't think any of us could ever get tired of listening to you um so this is a great example that I use, by, by the way, uh, to explain uh, nature and like how we need more of the solutions. You, you refer to uh, a certain kind of organism. I was going to say mushroom, but I'm translating from French right now. Uh, fungus. You know, said that like we should be uh, trying to approach system change and so on, looking um, at um, building an organism that would be like working like fungus. Uh, do you want to briefly uh, explain that? But I think it's very interesting for our audience. Well, um, okay. I mean, again, if uh, if I had to distill what regeneration is trying to deal with, it it's 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 assuming we have to shift our fundamental assumption um, that human beings and the systems that we create um, are, are living systems. You know, we're, we're not machines. We're, we're moving from uh, a way of thinking of the earth as, a, as a, an inanimate resource that we can extract things from and make to sell and then throw away. And there is no way. Um, we think we're separate from that. Whereas once you begin to understand that we are nature, nature is us, we're animals. The air we breathe has been produced by the, 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 the trees around us. Um, 
we're working walking on soil that is maintained and, and providing all the nutrients of the life around us, quite invisible to us, of all these little critters busily connecting with one another and sharing nutrients. So, and frankly, we're something like 80% microbes and bacteria anyway. <laughs> so this notion that we're somehow separate from and superior is what has got us into all the trouble um, we're in right now. So when you say, what is it relevant to, to nature? Well, this is, this is the core of it. Uh, the beauty is, again, that we now have so much more understanding, literally in the last 50 years, of, of ecology, of how nature really works, um, and, and what drives nature, you know, uh, what are the principles that nature uses in order to go from a few, you know, single cell beings 3.8 billion years ago, like the algae in my fish pond right now that I have to extract, um, to producing people like ourselves who can send people up to the, to the moon. Um, so in that we're realizing, yes, we actually are not uh, just um, insignificant. We are all ultimately connected. And that's the other thing, quantum physics, et cetera, uh, and other sciences are showing that everything matters. So. In any system, every single part matters. It contributes to the health and well-being of the whole. So this idea that you can't do anything, well, that's crazy. Right now we have, how many people are on board? 30 people in this room? You're all doing things. You're all part of this change. Um, your thinking actually affects everything. What comes out of your mouth affects everything. So it's that notion now of beginning to take back personal um, accountability uh, personal responsibility um, is a, is a key, key part of this. So um, building on that, Anna, what would you say should be the core principle of the tourism that we are all seeking to build, or the people in this room and, and the world in general? Well, I think, the, um, yeah, that's the beautiful thing is we can now identify some, what I call some core principles and that you will avoid at your peril. <laughs> And uh, there are some other principles that, which if you follow, make life a hell of a lot easier. Um, now, we haven't got time today to go into them in depth. Uh, the three most important one are to be starting to think ho in holes, um, by holes as in not in the things in the ground, but seeing things completely, seeing the connections. Um, and that's a lot harder than you might think, you know? Um, so when we look at tourism, we tend to break it into, immediately break it into all of its components. We break it into its um, subsectors and into its functions. But that's why this all comes down to this notion of place. You know, how is, you know, this place, this island different from any other island? You know, how is Venice so very, very different from Bucharest, for example? What is it the, its whole identity? its essence, and that's another feature of regeneration is that every, every being, every one of you is unique. Every one of you has a unique essence. Uh, you have a potential that you're here to express, right? This isn't metaphysical woo woo wah wah stuff that you hear on some, you know, um, health, um, what do you call it? Human development programs. This is reality. So again, it reactivates that, that notion of making um, a contribution. Um, but it does bring us back to this notion that, you know, this, I get very frustrated when people say, you know, travel the world to save the planet. <laughs> I mean, that's the most crazy notion I've ever heard of. Right? The best thing you could do is travel to save the planet right now would be probably to stay at home anyway. But I'm not recommending that. Um, it's not about saving the planet. It's about creating a planet in which humanity might survive. 99.9% .9 of the species that are around us right now, we're the survivors, but most species have gone extinct at some point. So anyway, first principle is seeing the whole. The second is fully recognizing our interdependence. So when you're looking at any development, any kind of initiative, you must be constantly thinking about the interactions, the interdependence with all of the other parts of the system. Again, our tendency is to very much define and confine our thinking. So that's a that's one area. Um, the second is is that you know what what are we here to do? We're here to contribute to the capability of all of those people and parts and life forms around us to thrive. That is the essence of life. What does life do? It contributes to the capability of life to thrive. So that's nice and generic because within that you can do a lot of very exciting things like that is exactly what Ryan is doing with, with Blue Ventures. 
Um, so I hope, that, I don't know, I'm, it's very hard in the short time we have to be very sy systemic about this. Um, obviously, you know, there's a lot of writing I can share with people so you can get a, a more of a fix, but does that sort of give you a sense of where it's different or how it's different? I, I think it does. I think it brings very core principles to how to look because you're really speaking about the mindset shift here. It's all, it's all up here, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think it's really essential because it might be better understood in other sector. We, what we found uh, with many of the people in this room and that you're going to meet because you say you're going to be joining us. Awesome. Uh, that we find that um, this way of thinking is often removed from tourism. I mean, it does not really, we don't see many like minded people. There are, uh, we, but but they are not as many as uh, there might be in other sectors, you know. That's also why we're trying to make it uh, raise awareness about the fact that tourism must tr be transformed. And there's so much that would change if we manage to make this industry regenerative. So much could be achieved. In fact, this is what you are uh, speaking about with the people that you're working with, right? Like how to transform to them, why it must be transformed. Could you please share a bit of the challenges that you have been facing as a thought leader and a practitioner uh, in regenerative tourism, which you have been coming across? Well, I think the challenge is that tourism has tended to isolate itself from general business and, you know, big thinking. Um, for as long as I've been involved in tourism, and we know it's a long time, uh, everyone's been saying why we're different. <laughs> we're not, you know, okay, we move our customers to the point of consumption as opposed to ship goods to people. Uh, and there are, you know, we're in the business of experiences. We're not in the business of things, despite the fact that we use this industrial model to create uh, the, in, the whole system. Um, so we've really got to open up. I mean, most a lot of tourism executives at the destination level are not really aware of the fundamental shifts of thinking that are going on in big business right now and are happening very, very quickly. Um, you're looking at major, major companies um, talking about, you know, the new form of capitalism, that the, their purpose is not um, just to make a profit. The profit is the, now the means to something. Um, but the real end result is to raise the well-being and, and health and vitality of the communities they work in. That idea has not seeped through to tourism, to, to a lot of the, the people in, in, in charge, as it were. Um, the other point is in tourism, nobody is in charge anyway. It's a network. <laughs> you can't direct it in the same way you could, you could probably even direct pharma, pharmaceutical business because there's, such a, there's no concentration of power it's, and it's a dynamic network. I think the biggest challenge we have right now is, we, again, um, the, the old system, the old way of thinking is encouraging us to identify a problem and then find someone to blame and then to fix it, all right? That doesn't help at all. <laughs> um, it also just focuses on the problem, which takes us back to the very thinking that created it. What I love about regeneration is it looks at a situation and says, what is, this, what is its potential? What are the possibilities? So in a place, a destination, for example, who is this place? Um, how does it work now? But what could it become? All right. So it's a very different orientation. Um, the third problem is really that, yes, right now, if you're talking about a paradigm shift or a fundamental mindset shift, a new way of thinking, you have to do something. You have to think. You have to reflect. You have to observe. You have to and most people haven't got time for that. They, they want to fix a problem. They want to get ahead. They want to produce something. Um, so how do we get people to become much more uh, critical, much more, ask more questions, um, reflect self-reflection, but also just take a, that holistic view? Um, there is an old problem that says, if you want to go somewhere really fast, slow down. We're trying to fix it all, but we, we haven't got much time. So that's the other challenge. Anyway, I um, hope that's not unduly negative, but I think tourism really has to, to get into the mainstream. Absolutely. And, and uh, so we're running a bit behind. I just want to ask Anna, would you have five extra minutes so that we can um, like, do the, yeah. So. I do, but I don't want to hold people up. By, uh, it's questioning. The questions are really important. I think. Yeah, absolutely. So like people, if you do need to leave, feel free to leave, but we'll have a-, a Oh, I'm not leaving. No, no, I'm, I'm in the audience. <laughs> I just wanted to uh, add something to what you said, because through our conversation, you also were, say, you also were explaining that there's a tension 
between the concept of sustainability and regeneration. And that it's still a message that must come across because people have, have a bit of a feeling that sustainability now is about ticking boxes, you know, because maybe it's gotten more into uh, company systems and so on. So there's a bit of a lack of this holistic uh, mindset that you were uh, discussing earlier. Um, so I think we're going to move on uh, to the questions now. So give you uh, all and the audience to uh, exchange with Anna as your question. So please, as earlier, um, if you have a question, raise your hands and uh, unmute yourself and try to keep it as short as possible. So we ma manage to have as many questions uh, as possible. Thank you very much. So is somebody raising his hand or hand? Otherwise, uh, okay, Ravi, go ahead. I don't want to. I don't want Anna to feel like nobody's asking questions, so I'll go first. And <laughs> I'm used to getting a, a, com a, a, a confounding silence, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so I hope there's more to follow. Anna, really, thanks for sharing your perspective. You've taken a systems approach to thinking about it, and and it is the right way to think about it. But it's really hard to kind of match the theory to practice. And um, just what we've been doing is we've been working with universities and aligning the programs that we are doing in, in, in the study abroad context and uh, basically mixing sustainable tourism with education abroad. So I would love to hear you know, some ideas or case studies that, uh, that, that uh, you've seen in practice that sort of brings the theory into uh, practice. And what are some of the key success factors that bridges this divide between theory and practice in your opinion? Because we really, that's the, that's the magic, magic one we are looking for. Yeah, um, I, don't, I, I don't understand this, this uh, constant, you know, theory and practice. I look, look, at, look at what we heard from Ryan, okay? I could, I could fit Ryan, what he's doing, into the theory of regeneration without any problem. Uh, he's doing it. OK, there are countless examples of people doing aspects of regeneration. Um, I, I, there are certain principles, however, that I think once we've begun to understand how they work, that's your theory. You would call that theory, I think. Um, but the, there are they're working principles, you know, um, uh, you don't need to, to get a Ph.D. in that either. <laughs> Um, but you start, what I'm trying to get people to, to, to realize is once they've internalized that principle, look, the principle of, for example, interdependence, everything is connected to everything else and depends on everything else. How do you apply that in your business? How do you apply the principle of, you know, look at the whole? So when you look at a person you're employing, how do you see them? Do you just see them as having a specific skill for which you pay them so much an hour? But or do you look at them as a whole person with a family living in this place and what they might be aspiring to and what their skills and strengths and weaknesses are and how you might be able to work with them to develop those in order for them to naturally end up giving you that much more value? You know, where does theory end and practice begin in that kind of example? Um, in terms of my, my experience, and, and again, I, there are people in the room who've you know, there's Roberto has been working in the whole social entrepreneurship. So many of those initiatives are naturally including these principles uh, in, the, in the way they do business. Um, you know, Diane is here who's, who's been teaching, how, teaching professionals how to make this, you know, more practical. Um, what we did in, in Flanders is quite interesting because that was really a place I got a chance to test some of these theories. <laughs> Um, we didn't talk about, we didn't lecture them on regeneration. Um, we basically said, you know, uh, what is it, um, got people into groups and said, you know, um, how, what would it feel like if this place were to really be flourishing? We started to throw out an objective of, you know, what would a thriving Flanders look like or your community look like and how might that differ from someone else's? So uh, I don't know, I'm not trying to evade your question, um, but I, I understand. I, think... I understand. So I guess the question was really like: there's tourism has been a, is a very old sector. It's an 800 pound gorilla with tremendous amount of momentum in the wrong direction. So it's kind of how do we sort of bring that sort of thinking into into this moving train and change the course? Is sort of well, I think yeah, was, okay. I yeah. mean, I love the discussion. So I'll, I, I, you know, but basically, 
one of the first things I think we need to do is dispel an awful lot of myths, okay? The, the real thing that frustrates me is, is people saying, yes, um, the indication is that if we change, we'll, we'll make less money or something like that. Um, tourism is about profit. Tourism is about maximizing profit. Um, and tourism is good for the country. But no, in every destination, I guarantee, hardly any destination will tell you where the money goes, mm. how much stays, how much is the cost. So we've been talking all about, all about this gross value of tourism, but we have no data on which to base that, uh, those statements. So what's starting to happen now is destinations are realizing the costs associated with having all of these visitors, this is pre-COVID of course, um, exceeded the benefit. But we, we, the first thing I would argue we have to do in tourism is be rigorous in that department. Um, otherwise we have no credibility and that's what was beginning to happen before COVID. Now we've got a problem where so many people jumped onto the tourism bandwagon and opened businesses with no thought about there ever being an interruption to that demand. We have now under tourism all over the planet. So we have an awful lot of people who believed in all of this, these statements and are now completely bankrupt, which is a horrible thing to be the situation. So as an industry, we've got to get a lot, a lot more rigorous in, in how we approach it. Thank you, that's helpful. And I will just add to what Anna said, that the fact that so many people are struggling now because of under tourism is a direct result of uh, over tourism and the systemic issues that we have in the industry. If you look at Venice now, it's an entire community that is struggling because unregulated tourism has meant that the community, the economy is completely shifted to tourism. And the minute you stop tourism, everybody is like, so even though there were leakage that was creating a lot of damages, it, it anyway switched the entire cities to be just wanted to give services to tourists. And so everything is, being, is collapsing right now. And in two to five years from now, we are very worried about what we're going to see here. Um, and there's so a perfect want... example of, of a destination not looking holistically. If you just look at growth, it appears to be in the destination's best interest to have more more visitors. They often also assume, therefore, we have to have more supply. So they give permits for, for the development of more hotels or more ports for cruises or whatever. And, and without thinking of the impact of that on the existing businesses, because every time you add to the supply and the demand doesn't go up, you create vulnerability for the existing supplier. So again, we have not taken that holistic approach. Um, I mean, right now, my argument is that if if scientists can, can look at a forest and tell you exactly how many, you know, how much carbon and water and minerals and nutrients are moving between these trees, which they can, why can't we do that in a community called tourism? Especially now that we're all connected electronically anyway. It's possible, we just haven't had the will to do it. Amazing thought, uh, thought, thought, thought. Uh, Anand, do you still have a few moments because there's Romanus and Diane that would have a question. Oh, uh, yeah. Good. <laughs> Wonderful. Thanks so much for your availability. We have the luck to have an audience that is really excited and full of questions. So I'm happy that you can stick around. So Romanus had uh, raised his hand. So go ahead, Romanus. Go is yours. Well, thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks very much for the insights. And uh, you've clearly been at this for a while. And that and it shows because uh, <laughs> the know. love that you've put into it uh, is, is evident in the insights that you're sharing. I wonder if you could... Um, Share some advice. Uh, one of the things that you said that intrigues me very much is, is that you know social entrepreneurs exhibit naturally many of the traits and principles that you're articulating, and whether they've stumbled across them and accidentally or whether they've worked very hard at them, the fact remains that when you look at their operations, they take a holistic view. They recognize it's one for all and all for one. They recognize that there never was anybody more than us, than more than one person on this planet, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So I wonder if you have some insights uh, in terms of how they could apply their operations and their insights in a way to locally integrate with, um, you know, our audience. In, in other words, you know, the idea of tourism has been in the past that you have to move, you know, body and motion is more easily transformed. And I think that with the pandemic, people are realizing that there are many other ways that you can learn and integrate and connect with your peers. So what advice would you have for social entrepreneurs that are looking to get the word out in an experiential transformative way, if that makes sense? So how, how do we apply the principles to change making 
to this audience that we're talking to, right? Because most of these audiences are, are change makers. They're people who are looking to integrate and create a better future for us all, which is, I think you described it as thriving, right? Yeah. So, and, and that principle, I think, applies in many ways. People believe, I think, in the past, I think it was also Mark Twain who said, travel is the way that you learn, right? But there's another way to do this, which is to connect with the communities that you're serving. So what advice do you have for social entrepreneurs in applying the principles uh, that you've learned and gleaned so well? Thank you. That's okay. There are different ways of answering, uh, answering that question. Um, I think one of the most exciting end results of COVID is that the, the consumer sentiment is, is shifting. People are now much more interested in where they're buying their food from, you know, who their suppliers are and so on. Um, and beginning to take a wake up and see what is in the community around them. I think this is a great opportunity to develop more social entrepreneur, entrepreneurship around, both around tourism and other areas, and also to be looking at these connections. So there's a wonderful connection, in my opinion, between regenerative tourism and regenerative agriculture, for example, and doing work in New Zealand. Um, how do we get you know, small enterprises, uh, farmers, uh, and I think Ryan showed this, because there you had marine conservation in part supported by a commercial activity called tourism, but then tourism was benefiting by able to offer its clients the chance to learn about the marine life or to get involved in what the farm is doing and learn more about nutrition. I find it, I'm not sure I'm answering your question because it's such a big one. <laughs> Suffice to say that I would love to see the destinations that I work with realize the potential of not just thinking about jobs, but thinking about business development and the cross-sectoral linkages. So more artisans, more, more young people being taken into opportunities. You know, let's take a hotel, look at all of its procurement. How much of that could be provided by local young, you know, young entrepreneurs rather than just everything procured through a massive system and buying something that's going to come on a cargo ship. Does that, does that begin to address it? Because I, I may not have fully understood the question, but. I think you did a fantastic job. I, I'm, I'm also thinking that every social enterprise has a tour, a tour that they give for potential donors, right? And some of them are better than others, but could you imagine what that would look like if that was actually an integrated experience uh, for both local and and, and, and you know, start maybe go to your destination organization and say, look, we've got all of these social entrepreneurs here, all local people doing local things. Could we organize an opportunity for people in the community to go and see them? You know, yeah, that, that's to be continued. I'll contact you yeah, after. But that, that's, I think it's an idea for all of us. I'm keen to hear, Diane. <laughs> and Roman, if I add something, can I add something? You could look at Athens. They've been doing something. They've created an... Um, place in the city uh, where you have social entrepreneurs and so there are some tools that are going there it's interesting what they've been there are attempts at this yes thank you and go on please yes yeah um just really quickly anna i guess um what i'm interested in is a reflection on the comment you made before about language uh and particularly uh Social entrepreneurs are though the 20% that, that spin around the edge that have the ideas and that are constantly connecting the dots. Um, they use comfortably the idea of, or the term regenerative tourism or, or any manifestation of that. You walk into DMOs and you know the kind of the rest of the 80% of the industry. And even though my feeling is that a lot of them support the ideas, they do not want to use the word regenerative tourism. And do you have any advice <laughs> about how you get over that barrier? Because to me, regenerative tourism catches something entirely uh, grander than, than SDGs. So how do you get over that barrier of, of them not wanting to use that word? Um, Thank you. Yeah, no, it's a good, it's an interesting question because, um, you know, I think you're, uh, I haven't come across that resistance expressed that way. Um, it could be, and what I, but what I have heard is a lot of people saying, oh no, we're just trying to get our people to understand sustainability and you bring this other long word. I mean, to be honest with you, um, I wish, 
I think that the term right now is is a bit of a problem for people in tourism because it means they have no this sounds rude doesn't it but it means that they have to think <laughs> um so I'm not too worried about uh, what I am worried about is when people start using the word I, I and I'm going to be quite outspoken right now um uh, the, there are destinations that are rushing to claim that, that we are the most regenerative destination. You know, I, they will be nameless for the purposes of this recording. Um, but they're cherry picking things that entrepreneurs in many cases are doing <laughs> uh, to suggest that they are regenerative. Regenerative is a state of mind. You cannot hold that state of mind and still persist in saying we're going to double tourism as soon as COVID is over. All right, you cannot. You're not being you're not you're not being uh, consistent. You're not you're not being honest with yourself. You don't understand it. So um, the problem with the term light regeneration is that it's literally getting thrown around and misused and used. And that's how systems that don't want to change have always handled these things. They've absorbed and manipulated and twisted. I think the most important thing right now is for us to focus less on selling the concept but getting people to practice it you know which is the work you've been doing which i i, I really applaud um it's like flanders they're just quietly bidding on and saying we're going to travel towards a different tomorrow we're going to engage people in conversations we're going to tell their stories we're going to give them support we want to aim at communities that are flourishing they don't use the word regeneration they're just getting on with it right so I think that's where I'm concerned that when we package these things up and start to sell it, we, we can actually create more problems for ourselves. I don't know. I'm thinking out loud as I often do, Diane. Love to have that conversation some more. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, Anna. And I, you know, what you're saying, I think probably many of us can relate to it. I remember one thing, speaking people were recognized for being a very green destination. And they were mention mentioning how important the cruise industry is. And I was like, oh, <laughs> you can't be that air serious. So we're going to take one last question, Jason, if you could be very brief. I'm sorry, Vicky, but uh, like Anna's already, unless Anna uh, tells me the contrary, but she's already uh, being so, uh, um, giving us so much uh, extra time. So I really leave it to Anna. Jason, could you please be really brief and then uh, Anna let you uh, let us know if you must go or yeah, if you have time. Okay. Uh, Namahi, uh, Anna, I just wanted to ask you if you took yourself back yeah. to your younger self, which direction would you take knowing what you know presently regarding tourism and where would it be and what would it represent? Namahi. Thank you. Um, hmm. I think if I go back to my younger self, I was doing what I'm doing now. <laughs> In fact, it's really depressing. I came across, a, I did a, a, a sustainable tourism strategy for British Columbia back in 2008, and I opened it up the other day, and it's everything that people are talking about now, the four capitals about health and vitality. And, you know, back in 1995, because of my interest with, uh, and I was, you know, you can do the math, that's a long time ago. Um, again, because of the time I had spent with First Nations in, in Western Canada, I, I wrote a thing called Shifting Gears, which was all about the application of the medicine wheel and that holistic thinking. So um, my attitude now looking back uh, on my life is that uh, the universe has presented me with, you know, all the right experiences that are, uh, have shaped me now. Um, and again, I suppose as a, a, a parting thought, um, we we're we're every one of us here is is on this planet right now to help make this transition that's that's the way i feel and um but what this and there's a, that creates this tremendous sense of you know urgency and i've got to do this and i've got to do that um but when you do spend time um with people of, of this deeper wisdom you begin to relax and realize you're probably in exactly the right place doing the right thing right now you can't force it you can't force the system to change you can act within the system and models change and you can make a difference but you can't sit there and say i'm going to do this to the system if you try and you know uh, prick it to do something you'll get a very different response so what have i learned um i've learned to be a lot more relaxed 
Now, some people, including my partner right now, will say, that's not true at all. You had a big <laughs> episode yesterday. <laughs> but, you know, generally, I feel you have to learn to see that your life is unfolding as it, as it should, provided that you stay true to, to your, um, you know, your fundamental values and principles. And I look at around this particular group and I think, you know, I'm in great company. Thank you for the question, though. It makes me go down memory lane. <laughs> What a beautiful way maybe to close uh, our conversation for, the, uh, for today. Anna, uh, do you want to share one last word? Well, I, I think I just said it really. It's just that, um, you know, every one of you is going to make your own unique, beautiful contribution. And really just perhaps spend some time just saying, what, what brings me joy? You know, what do I love doing? And, you know, really invest in that because that probably is what you're here to do. Wonderful. Thanks so much. And I think we uh, are all tremendously glad that all the wins that you've shared with us, the time that you have uh, taken for us. I also would like to thank all of you because it's incredible. You've stuck around. Everybody has said, thank so you. it's beautiful. It's great to have had such an audience uh, uh, to see your interest and commitments and uh, to transforming tourism and leverage, uh, leverage it for the good of our communities and, and of the environment. So I really hope that when this session help you see the potential of tourism to help build uh, this more equitable and regenerative future that uh, we all want uh, to see. I hope so. also hope that you will leave this session with the new core principles uh, that Anna shared with us and that you'll be able to embed it in all uh, the work that you will do in the future. If you are interested in taking an active role in the transformation of tourism, I'm sure that many of you already are doing so, uh, but there are two actions that I'd like to underline here. You could uh, be joining and the tourism issue-based group uh, of uh, Catalyst 2030 if you're interested in co-creating new tourism-related initiative with system change as a focus. And you could also, if you have a best practice to share or are in a position to help uh, facilitate the adoption of new ways of measuring success, new models, mindsets, and norm in tourism, uh, let us know at the link I'm send, uh, sharing with you here, which is Tourism Realize. Uh, that org, which is something that uh, is going to be a collaborative, a multi-stakeholder, multi-level network aiming to accelerate the transformation of tourism because we are far behind with the SDGs and we must uh, go a bit fa uh, faster with our change. So I really welcome all of you uh, mm -hmm. to uh, take a look. Anna is actually uh, one of our senior advisors there. So I really look forward to seeing uh, what we'll be able to, to do with all of your wisdom and the guidance of people uh, like Anna. So thank you very much uh, to all of you. This recording will be, sorry for the dogs barking outside, <laughs> nature <laughs> this recording will be available uh, for viewing i'll um, make sure to send it to and uh, everybody who has recorded to uh, register to this event and um if people want to follow up with question anna how can they contact you uh right now the simplest thing is to, to uh email me anna at conscious travel um and i'd be very grateful if you are interested uh to do that um i'm hoping in the next uh, few weeks to launch um, a website called regenerativetourism.com, um, which is designed to be a convocation again of people. So it would be connected with tourism allies, but it's a source of quality information, articles, people, expertise, um, so that we can you know, connect with one another. So utterly compl complimentary, I think. Thank you very much again, Anna. Thank you. Wonderful audience. Hope Guys. to see many of you at our, at our bi weekly calls on Tuesday morning. Uh, Saturday morning, CET time and BST time, so that we can have all our friends from the Australasia area join us. And I wish you all a beautiful day. Maybe we can do one last thing all uh, like put a video on and uh, do wave back goodbye so we can uh, make a nice uh, family photo. Bye-bye, <laughs> okay. everybody. Thank you so bye very bye. much for coming. Happy to Thank see you all so. your beautiful person. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Valeria. That was a wonderful meeting. Thank you. Very happy you were yeah. here. Thank, Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you, Valeria. Adios, everyone.
Bye bye, everybody. Have a beautiful rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you.